we're happy to have uh, uh, Steve Balvis from the University of Oxford. He uh, did his uh, undergrad work in uh, physics and mathematics at MIT, then went to graduate school at University of California in Berkeley. Came back to MIT Princeton for postdoc appointments and then accepted a faculty position at the University of Virginia in 1985. And there he worked on several different problems in astrophysical fluids, the best known of which, undertaken with John Hawley, became the accepted theory for the onset of turbulence in accretion disks. And uh, then he moved to the, which, which many of you will, will know his name from, from that work, uh, and then he moved to the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris in 2004. Just recently last year, he accepted the civilian uh, Chair of Astronomy at Oxford University in England, so that's, that's where he is now. And, uh, and about five years ago, he became interested uh, not only in accretion, accretion disks, but also in the, in the interior of the sun, and that's what I'll talk about today. So we're happy to have Steve Balbus. And he'll be here until um, t tomorrow and also Friday morning. So if you want to chat with him, let me know, and we can set that up. Thank you, Mark. So uh, I don't need to tell this audience that uh, the problem of the internal uh, stellar dynamics, in particular the internal uh, rotation of the sun, um, its precision determination, I think, is really one of the most beautiful astronomical results of the last half century. Um, and that's a, that's a half century where there have been a lot of astronomical results that have been coming down the pike. Um, it is, sure. it is, I think it's a, it's a pity that it hasn't uh, attracted the attention of people just outside the immediate solar community. Uh, as someone who enjoys problems in astrophysical fluids, the problem of the sun's rotation is particularly fascinating because there's so much in play and we actually have good data. Uh, it's the only non-trivial fluid velocity field in astrophysics that is known with certainty. And hence it's a very interesting test of the state of our knowledge of astrophysical gas dynamics. When I made this statement in an earlier talk I didn't include the word non-trivial. So I said it was the only velocity field in astrophysics that was even known with any certainty. And Scott Tremaine was in the audience and he immediately shouted out, Hubble flow. So, all right. Except for V proportional to R, uh, it's, will, it is true, it's the only velocity field with any kind of structure which is known in, in detail. So that makes it uh, a fascinating problem for the theorist. The primary findings, just to remind you, several in the to several in the audience, this will be rather familiar, so I apologize for the review. Uh, there is significant differential rotation in the convective zone and a small section of the radiative zone. The differential rotation is strongly, though not exclusively, therefore, associated with the zone of turbulence in the sun, the outer convective zone where, as its name suggests, the sun is convectively turbulent. Roughly speaking, the angular rotation is constant on cones of constant theta, where theta is the co-latitude, and that's true at mid-latitudes, and then more cylindrical near the equator, more spherical near the poles. So these are uh, uh, the recent findings that I took from Rachel Howe of the Gong data, these are the angular velocity contours of the sun. And you can see that the primary sense one has is sort of a series of parallel lines. So you see it's not quite exactly uh, constant on zones of, or on curves of constant r, but that's not a bad description in the bulk of the zone. And then there's a region, the tachocline and the near surface shear layers. I won't talk too much about the surface shear layers. I'll try to say something about the tachocline later in the talk. So 
The most striking feature is the fact that omega, the angular velocity, tends to be insensitive to depth. Total variation, by the way, is not so very much. If you take the average value of omega, the difference between the poles and the equator is about plus, plus or minus 15 percent. The tachocline region, the near surface shear layers. Now, at one level, the results, especially, especially when they first appeared, I took people by surprise. The convective zone is, after all, very nearly adiabatic. That means that the pressure in, is a function of the density alone. P goes like rho to the five thirds. Convective motions, except near the near, in the near surface shear layers, are likely to be small. In the, measured typically on scales 30 to 50 meters per second. Now, a barotropic fluid, which is what a fluid in which constant pressure surfaces and constant density surface coinciding, such a fluid is said to be barotropic. A barotropic fluid in hydrostatic equilibrium must rotate on cylinders. I'll use capital R for cylindrical radius throughout this talk. So I offer the following, this will be familiar for probably 90% of you, but I have the following what I call this Bhaskaran proof. Bhaskara was the Indian mathematician who was famous for his one word proof of the Pythagorean theorem where he drew this diagram and said, behold. So my equivalent proof of the assertion that a barotropic fluid in hydrostatic equilibrium must rotate on cylinders is I write down this equation and I say, behold. Now, to fill in just a little bit of the details, the left side uh, depends or is in the direction, this is the centripetal term or centripetal term, in the radial R direction, that is cylindrical radius. On the right side, I have the gradient of the gravitational potential plus one over rho, one over rho grad p. If p is a function of rho, as it is by assumption, then the entire right-hand side is the gradient of something, which I've called epsilon there. And if the gradient of this thing has only an r component, then epsilon can depend only on r. And that means omega can depend only on r. It's a very simple proof. The solar rotation profile is decidedly not constant on cylinders. It is not barotropic in this sense. It is baroclinic. So to understand the impl implications of this, we need to look at vorticity, the vorticity equation. Here is our steady state Eulerian equation. V dot grad V is minus grad V over rho minus grad phi. We use the usual vector identity to convert V dot grad V into the gradient of V squared over 2 plus omega cross V. Upon taking the curl of that equation, we wind up with, I guess this is the Helmholtz vorticity equation, curl of V cross omega, where omega is itself the curl of V. We take the phi component of thereof, thereof and that's set equal to grad P cross grad rho over rho squared, gravitational potential vanishing when we take the curl. So this is a way, in some sense, to isolate a part of the, just the rotational dynamics of this problem. The principal radial force balance has been removed from the vorticity equation. So from now on, I will use both cylindrical coordinates and spherical coordinates. and. I'll use them interchangeably. They may both appear in the same equation, so be alert to the, uh, to the, to the notation here. Capital R, phi, z for cylindrical coordinates. Lowercase r, theta, colatitude measured from the z-axis, and phi. The two phi's are, of course, the same phi. Now, for the problem at hand, it's very useful to convert the vorticity equation into what is known as the thermal wind equation, something that is used often in geophysical applications. 
So if I start with the curl of B cross omega equal grad P cross rho over rho squared, and I want to look at what form that equation takes for pure rotation. So omega here can depend on, it's not no assumptions of axis symmetry. Excuse me, no assumptions of, uh, of radial symmetry. So it can depend on little r and theta, or it can depend upon capital R and Z. It doesn't depend upon phi. So under these circumstances, the left side of the equation, when you work it through, involves only the z gradient of omega squared. And for the right side, uh, something interesting happens, especially if we are interested in applying this equation to the convective zone, which is very nearly adiabatic. Normally, these gradients here, grad, this would involve uh, dp dr times a d rho d theta minus a dp d theta uh, d rho dr. And working out what that difference is is a rather delicate exercise since the theta gradients are much smaller by of order the centripetal parameter. The theta gradients are much smaller than the radial gradients. And so forming that difference is a rather delicate operation. In a case where we're dealing with a nearly adiabatic fluid, there's a very nice simplification that can be made. So what we do, I take one of these rows, put it inside a logarithm, inside the gradient. Then I stick in a p to the minus 1 over gamma. Gamma is the usual adiabatic index. And I can do that without penalty, because the error terms that I incur are of order grad p cross grad p. So those vanish. But now that I have the p to the minus 1 over gamma inside my logarithm, I can convert that into an entropy variable so that this is grad, grad p cross a gradient of what I'll call sigma, log p rho to the minus gamma. And then the nice thing is that when I work with the entropy, because the radial entropy gradient is already very, very small. I don't have this delicate subtraction. I have one term, which is a dp dr times a d sigma d theta, and then another term, which involves a d sigma dr dp d theta. But the d sigma dr dp d theta involves two very small terms, whereas the dp dr d sigma d theta involves the large gravitational field, grad p over rho is very big. So that term dominates in the region where the process of convection has almost eliminated the radial gradient. Almost eliminated, but not eliminated entirely. And of course, it is these small gradients that are the heart of the problem here. So we don't want to be too cavalier in our treatment of them. So this is the thermal wind equation. It has this nice, neat, compact form. And g of r in the convective zone is also particularly simple, because the convective zone of the sun has very little of the mass. So to an excellent approximation throughout the bulk of the convective zone, g is simply g m solar over r squared. G in that context being the Newtonian. This says large scale latitudinal entropy gradients cause departures from cylindrical iso rotation contours. In other words, deviations from a barotropic equation of state resulting in a theta gradient, latitudinal gradient of the entropy, give rise to the baroclinic gradients in the angular velocity. In the sun, the solar trend is that moving polewards, omega decreases and sigma increases. It's important to get a sense of just the relative scaling of these numbers. So if I write this equation in a dimensionless form by dividing through on both sides by omega squared, the gradients in the angular velocity that we're talking about are numbers that are of order 10%. On the right-hand side, notice I have a very big term, 
Here's my centrifugal parameter, the gravitational field divided by the centrifugal force. That's a number of order 10 to the 5. So if these two terms are going to balance, the relative latitudinal gradient in the entropy must be a very small number indeed, something of order 10 to the minus 6, causing temperature changes of a few degrees over the million degrees or so that's typical of the solar convective zone, or several hundred thousand degrees. Now, typically, the radial gradient of this entropy is a number of, of order a few times 10 to the minus 5. That's from mixing link theory. That's about how much people estimate that you need in order for the convection to be vigorous to carry the solar luminosity. Now, that's a big number, even though it's at some point, in some sense, it's very small. It's still a big number relative to the entropy gradient, factor of 20 or so. The value of n squared, the brunt weisel frequency, what would be the frequency of oscillation if that were a nice positive number. Uh, otherwise, it's a measure of the growth rate of convective instability. The value of n squared, the value of omega squared are not very different. It's very important to keep the centrifugal parameter in mind. It's either a very big number or a very small number, depending on whether you're dealing with this epsilon or its reciprocal. Because if I go back to the original equation now, you notice that on the left side, I have my omega gradient, which is what we are interested in explaining and measuring. And on the right-hand side, I have a factor of 1 over epsilon here. And here I have a kind of a dimensionless combination of the gradients of the pressure and the density. Which means that if I'm going to say something about my angular velocities, I would need to know the difference between isobaric and isochoric surfaces to better than a part in 10 to the 5. So the angular velocity is measuring very, very small differences in the orientations of those surfaces. All right, so is it time to declare victory? Well, no, we have one differential equation, and we have two unknowns. So how do you solve something like that? Anybody can solve a well-posed partial differential equation. It's the tough guys that go after the ill-posed equations. Uh, at some point, we'll need them. You're quite right. Let's begin with some heuristics. When in doubt, start with heuristics. Please. Yeah. Yes, but the energy e equation for uh, the entropy, depending upon exactly how you set it up, uh, isn't necessarily very helpful. It's very difficult in particular to get information on the latitudinal gradients of the entropy. You have some handle on the radial gradients of the entropy. Uh, Well, I don't want to prejudice by saying which, what causes what, because that's actually a rather delicate question. But I need, to, I, need to, I need to develop some kind of a constitutive relationship between the entropy and the angular velocity. So this is a set of conservation equations, so there is no real cause and effect. They just evolve in time. To that's right. There's nothing in the equation that implies cause and effect. There's no... Uh, the time-independent balance. Right. This is not, not so much a conservation equation as it is a dynamical balance. Somehow arrived there. Somehow what? Arrived there. 
<laughs> Somehow, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe if I let me let me uh, go forward a bit, and then that might help clarify where I'm going with this. And then, if you still have questions, then we'll be in a better uh, position to answer them. So, some heuristics. First of all, does it make sense just within the context of the thermal wind equation that omega should be? Oh, that's not omega should be a function of theta, not r. Got that one wrong. That's what happens when you add a new graph at the last moment. Does it make sense that omega should be a function of theta in the context of TWB, thermal wind balance, or TWE, the thermal wind equation? Let's see if we've got the right equation to begin with. This is a turbulent region, so things could go wrong. Let's start by using what we know. The angular gradient of omega much exceeds the radial gradient. Omega is insensitive to r. Do we know anything about, or can we say anything about the behavior of the entropy gradients? Well, the thermal wind uh, equation, in terms of the entropy, and actually in terms of omega as well, but let me focus on the entropy here, has a sort of gauge invariance. The radial gradients, the spherical radial gradients of sigma don't matter. I can add or subtract any function of r, and I still get an equation which is just as good. So in particular, let me define sigma prime, which is sigma minus sigma sub r, a function which depends only on radius. It can be, for the sake of argument, just sort of a background driving entropy that we would have even in the absence of rotation, which gets the solar luminosity out of the sun by, via these convective motions. And then I can subtract off this dominant radial component of the entropy profile, which is perhaps a factor of 20, you recall, larger than the portion of the entropy which is responsible for that theta gradient. And then I write the equation in terms of sigma prime instead of sigma. Now, let's talk about convection in its simplest essence, at least for me, its simplest essence. In a radially symmetric convective zone, d sigma dr is very tightly constrained. That radial entropy gradient really is the throttle sets the powerful convective transport heat engine. We need to get exactly one luminosity worth of energy out of the sun, no more, no less. You force too steep or like too shallow a d sigma dr, and it will immediately pop back up or go back down due to the suppression of convection or the active encouragement of convection. And the excess or deficit entropy gradient will be immediately smeared out. Only d sigma dr matters here. The constant sigma offset is irrelevant. I can add or subtract a constant to the entropy. It doesn't matter. So if I were to plot sigma versus r, I'd have a very well-defined fixed slope. The location of the line doesn't particularly matter in that plane. If I now go to a slowly rotating convective zone, once again, d sigma dr is still very tightly constrained. You need to get a solar luminosity out, just as before. Within a convective cell, the locally constant sigma offset is once again irrelevant to the turbulent transport. But what is different now is that there's no particular reason why that offset needs to be the same at all latitudes because rotational physics changes when I go from one latitude to another. From thermal wind balance, a small difference in the offset can actually make a big difference to what omega is doing. Because what we referred to in those earlier slides as sigma prime in the thermal wind equation is precisely the offset that we're talking about. 
So now if I plot sigma versus r, then I have one value of sigma prime with one, with one offset. Sigma prime 2 is the offset for this slope, sigma prime 3. They can be more or less the same sigma of r at each latitude, but with different offsets. Does this make sense in terms of the dynamics? Well, let's start first with linear theory. A lot of people don't, including myself, uh, didn't learn the lessons of just linear theory first. They're sort of surprising. Here is the dispersion relation, I think first written down by Cowling in 1951, for local WKB perturbations in a rotating, uh, uniformly rotating background, but with the pressure and the density not necessarily one-dimensional. They can depend on capital R and Z, on R and Th. And it looks rather complicated. These, funny, this curly D here is a combination of KR and KZ and these partial derivatives. But one thing which is apparent even from this linear equation is that if I have a purely e to the i m phi mode, then this whole term cancels out. And with it, the entire effect of the rotation, this 4 omega squared term, the Rayleigh discriminant, which is involved, embodies the rotational dynamics, that goes away if kz is 0. And I'm just left with m squared over k squared r squared. k squared is the same as m squared over r squared. This is just 1. And I have the usual dispersion relation for what amounts to a growth rate at the brunt visor frequency. There's no Coriolis effect. That's the most rapidly growing mode corresponding to a purely azimuthal wave number and a purely radial displacement. Well, if I were lecturing to a class of students here, I won't insult your intelligence, because you'll know the answer immediately. But the question I would ask them is, how is that possible? I have a system which is rotating. I have a displacement which is exactly radial. W where's the Coriolis force? Where did it go? How can it just disappear? And the answer is geostrophic balance. For these particular modes, there's another term in the equation of motion besides the Coriolis force, which is dp d phi. And there's actually a pressure gradient term. And the dominant balance, in the case of rotation, which allows these radial modes to take over, is that dp d phi equal to 2 omega v sub r. There is no azimuthal deflection. And that was kind of an interesting surprise. What about when we have a velocity gradient? Well, then life gets a little bit more complicated. And as far as I know, until Emmanuel Schaun and I wrote down this equation, I hadn't seen it in the literature before. But if we want to discuss now just the linear theory of embedded shearing three-dimensional disturbances in a two-dimensional background, with omega depending on r and theta, and sigma depending on r and theta. I need to go into local Lagrangian coordinates. I need to be very careful with my wave numbers, because the wave numbers get wrapped up in the sheet. And if there are astrophysicists in the audience, they'll know about Goldreich and Lindenbell, 1965, which was the first paper, as far as I know, in the astrophysical community that discussed this modification for the problem of spiral arms. Very important here because it introduces the gradient of, of omega directly into the wave number. But then this is my differential equation for the Lagrangian displacements. And what I find is that, at least for the angular velocity that the sun has chosen, where omega is basically a function of theta, sigma prime is a function of theta. Here's my sigma of r, my background driving 
entropy gradient responsible for the convection process. Then the psi dot grad omega squared and psi dot grad sigma prime terms both go away. This is a centrifugal term. This is, of course, just a pressure gradient term. It's the buoyancy term, a better way to describe it. Very interesting. Notice, of course, that already psi dot grad omega squared psi dot grad of sigma, the angular velocity and the entropy both appear in the dynamics on the same footing, psi dot gradient of something, which is very interesting. There's already this sort of dynamical connection built into the equations. So that even with differential rotation, there's still something self-consistent about having radial motion and not worrying directly about the effect, at least to this order, of Coriolis deflections. Yeah. That's, I think. Well, you do have geostrophic balance because I've checked it myself. So you need, yeah. I mean, there is at least in this local approximation, there is an otherwise an unbalanced two omega cross v term, and the. All right, we should, I should look at it afterwards. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what the difference is. But there is, this, there is at least, uh, there is a geostrophic balance in the equations. So wait, I'm going a little fast. Well, the interesting thing here is that if both my offset, sigma primed, and as indicated by the data, omega are both constant in the same nearly radial cell, then of course I can write sigma prime as some function of omega squared. And this important function we dub the residual entropy delta sigma and give it the status of a function that we want to put on a good dynamical footing. Because in numerical simulations, especially of the kind that people here excel at, delta sigma is quite close to the directly calculated quantity. Sigma of r in the simulations is imposed by hand, the background forcing entropy. And what is calculated is the response. Delta sigma, I think, is basically swept clean in a variation within a mixing cell by the convective process itself. There can be much greater latitudinal or cell-to-cell -cell variation in delta sigma than there is within a convective scale cell. So does this picture actually work in practice? Well, here is a <laughs> slice, a meridional slice, from one of Mark's simulations. I think it's Mish, Brun, and Tumri, as the et al. run AB3 of their paper. Here is the color coded angular velocity. Here is the residual entropy. And here is the total entropy. And you notice that the form of these delta sigma surfaces does follow. The colors are opposite, because one is going up while the other is going down. But the basic kind of shape is indeed very similar. The entropy doesn't look like anything in particular. Now, if it were the case that delta sigma is a function only of omega squared, then the thermal wind equation, the characteristics thereof, the characteristics partial differential equation, 
Those characteristics would in fact define the isorotational surfaces that we're interested in solving. In other words, if this is right, the sun is a great big analog computer. And it is solving this partial differential equation. The helioseismology data is kindly displaying in graphical form the characteristic structure of this particular partial differential equation. That would be nice. So, my d sigma d theta converts to a partial omega squared, partial theta times f prime of omega squared. The prime here denotes a derivative. We don't know this function a priori. At some point, we need an additional equation. But it turns out, to get the form of the characteristics, we don't need to know f of omega squared. How would we go about solving that equation? Well, first of all, we begin by writing everything out, finally, in spherical coordinates. f prime, the derivative of my residual entropy with respect to omega squared. The solution of this partial differential equation is that omega squared is a constant along the characteristic d theta dr equals minus all this stuff. Now, since omega is a constant along this characteristic, f prime is a constant along that characteristic. So it's a constant. I don't need to know what it is. From my point of view, it's a parameter. Can we solve this ordinary differential equation? It looks a little bit hairy. It's the kind your brother would put on an 1803 exam and torture the students with. But in fact, this is one case where we get lucky. If we set y equals sine theta, put it back into the differential equation, then I wind up with a linear equation in y squared. And so I'm off and running. I know how to solve, if nothing else, first order linear ordinary differential equations. Putting in g equals gm over r squared, the solution is incredibly simple. It is cylindrical r squared is some constant, this is an integration constant, minus b over r. I've written it in this way so that b will be a positive number. And b is a combination of terms, which includes my f prime. If I estimate crudely on the basis of these order of magnitude approximations that I gave before, b over r cubed, that's the dimensionless form of b, is a number which is not very different from unity, a number less than but of, of order unity. So does this result make sense in terms of the helioseismology data? Well, we can see immediately that for small r, I'm talking about a dominant balance between the a and b term, that is to say spherical r should be roughly constant for the isothermal surfaces. And then when capital R is big, then the dominant balance would be between r squared and a, so I get something which is more cylindrical looking. That would be the equator. That's the correct trend. If I write this a little bit more carefully, if I begin at some location r0, someone asked about a boundary condition. Well, here's our boundary condition. We do need one. This is not a complete theory. This simply starts off by looking at omega at some surface, and it tells you how to figure out what it looks like underneath. Let's begin at R0, the starting point of our characteristic. Theta 0 is some particular value of theta, where we want to begin uh, solving for a particular characteristic. The form of the curve is then independent of what I choose for omega. If I write beta as b over r0 cubed to make it dimensionless, then the form of my equation looks like this. Once I've put in the boundary condition that theta must equals theta naught at r equals r naught, and beta is for the moment a free parameter. Just to point out, there's nothing special about the 1 over r potential. If I had left it entirely in terms of phi of r, I would have gotten a very similar looking equation, something to bear in mind for other applications. How does it work? Well, this is the fit that uh, my student presented to me. Just 
making beta a two-parameter function, some number plus some other number times sine squared theta zero. Can I, how well do I get the entire sun? So don't look at the tacu Klein. Don't look at the near surface shear layers, but concentrate on the bulk of the convective zone. And I think it looks amazingly well. So here I've eliminated by the thick yellow lines, I've eliminated the surface shear layers and the tacu Klein. And there is Julius Bonnard's fit, even capturing some rather delicate shifts from convex to concave functions. So it works very well. We need to know a little bit more about why the entropy and the angular velocity care about each other so much. I've given some indications that there's basically some interesting physics going on related to convective cells operating in surfaces of constant omega and smoothing entropy gradients so that sigma prime, the offset, is a constant within the cell. And that's the basic, simple physical reason why there's a connection. But we can tighten it up a bit. First, via numerical simulations from the same run A, B, and 3, here's the validity of the thermal wind equation to the extent that these two colors look the same the d omega squared dz gradient is balancing off the d sigma d theta term. So I choose this one, by the way, because it looks the most like the sun. Every single numerical simulation of the solar convective zone doesn't give uh, uh, the same fit. This was chosen because the profiles for the particular boundary conditions that we're using did a uh, particularly nice job of reproducing the solar interior, the convective zone interior. So the thermal wind equation looks like it is describing the principal dynamical balance. We've seen this slide illustrating the similarity in the surfaces of residual entropy and angular velocity. And so it makes sense to at least use this equation as a foundation for understanding the helioseismology data, something that a few years ago, I think, might have been more controversial. But to understand a little bit more, what we really need, of course, is that if I take my residual entropy, everything will work if it's an additive function of omega squared plus g of r. Because any g of r is from the equation. Now, speaking entirely on mathematical footing, let's forget about our physical picture of convective mixing. How might this arise? This is the same as the sigma prime. That Delta sigma is the same as sigma prime. Sigma prime I wanted to use as an offset. I mean, it's the same thing. I'm using a slightly different notation to emphasize different aspects of the problem. Was delta sigma think of as the real entropy minus some radial dependent function. So this kind of a decomposition arises in a very well posed asymptotic limit, namely a Taylor series. Delta sigma is a function of r and theta. Omega squared is presumably a function of r and theta. Hence, we are free to regard delta sigma as a function of omega squared and r, as long as that's not a, if the Jacobian of the transformation doesn't vanish, yada, yada, yada. Now, the range of omega and the range of r, neither of them is particularly large. So let's begin with a leading order expansion. Delta sigma as a function of omega squared in R is some function of omega squared plus some function of R. Well, that's exactly what we were looking for. So there's something about this that's almost inevitable. Now let's see if we can do a little bit better, not restrict ourselves to such a tight leading order Taylor expansion. If we do an expansion in R just by itself, and we have some control over r, after all, then delta sigma as a function of r, we begin at the midpoint, at the, the, the mid radius in the convective zone, and then include an r minus r0, partial, partial r delta sigma of constant omega now. And the point is, is that if this difference is already small, 
and this derivative is not large, then crudely speaking, delta sigma will just be a function of omega squared. Now, is this self-consistent if we sort of go back and see whether it makes sense to drop this term? Well, yes, because the data, in fact, show that omega is, in fact, very insensitive to radius. So that if delta sigma is a function of omega squared, and omega squared is itself a function of r, or rather is a function of theta, because sigma is insensitive to r, then indeed, when I carry out this partial derivative at constant omega, it's not going to contribute very much. The physical basis of this is that the residual entropy is swept clean in R by convection. Its derivative is not large. The bottom line is that this is going to be a small term. This is going to be a small term. The correction to this is quadratic in small quantities, not linear in small quantities. The results are insensitive to how we parameterize beta. This is a global constant beta. I haven't even bothered to fit. Here's the gong data. The tachocline is an additional piece of physics, which I haven't discussed, so you shouldn't focus on that. But the general trend of these characteristics, really, in detail, it doesn't mimic quite as nicely as the fit that you saw by Julius Bonart, but the trend is certainly unmistakable. Now, convection cells are also likely to live in surfaces of constant omega. If I just look at mass flux conservation and expand rho v in a Fourier series, where this mu here, amplitude, is a function which depends upon the wave number k, but I have to remember that I'm talking about shearing wave numbers here. k minus mt times the gradient of omega. And if the divergence of rho v is zero, then each of the k dot mu k should be zero. And if this term is dominant, as it will be if k zero is small here, then in fact mu k dot the gradient of omega is zero, so the mass flux will be within constant omega surfaces. Now why should k zero be small? Well, it's because most of these modes will be dominated by e to the i m phi. And these modes are untouched is perhaps a little bit too strong, insensitive to omega. So this is what I discussed earlier. In the linear theory, there's no Coriolis effect for the most rapidly growing pure e to the i m modes, i m phi modes with radial velocities. This was the same equation in Lagrangian coordinates, including the effects of differential rotations so I won't repeat the arguments. I went through them before. Basically, these terms are very small. Yeah. Which k now? Vector k or? I don't know what horizontal means. Perpendicular to? Uh, yes. Well, no. KR and KZ are not perpendicular to gravity. M is perpendicular to gravity. KR and KZ in general will have a component along gravity. Maybe that's part of our problem. My point is if you take the K and the very large, Well, uh, the point is, is that that goes away even when k is not particularly large, as long as you have no kz. If you have no kz, then, then this will, there are different ways in which you'll get back 
to the pure maximum growth rate. But one of them is that the e to the i m phi mode, the most rapidly growing modes, uh, will be when this term goes away and this number is unity, because that is a number that must be smaller than unity. And to make that unity, it needs to be pure m. You don't need a viscous diffusion. I mean, I'm not sure what you mean. I'm ignoring viscosity here, so I'm assuming. But what, yes, but what, which, which wave numbers are the fastest growing in this whole dispersion equation? Which have, which have the fastest growth rate? The fastest growth rate are pure M modes with 0 kr and 0 kz. What would that be? Any M. But it depends that, on that. No, because then I have M over M if it's a pure M mode. K depends. Now, I can even go one level bigger. If I go back to the full problem now and look at the theory of three-dimensional embedded disturbances with omega as a function of r and theta, sigma a function of r and theta, and assume that I'm perturbing about the k0 of 0. What I mean is that the poloidal components of kr, so everything except the azimuthal. There's an m there, kr and kz are 0. And I take the solution to the full system of equation to linear order in the gradient of omega. So I do an expansion with small differential rotation, which in fact is valid for the sun. This is a 10 to 15 percent effect. What I find is that in the radial equation, there's no change. In the theta equation, Interestingly enough, there is a first-order contribution from the omega gradient, but only if it's baroclinic. There is no contribution if d omega is a function of cylindrical r. The sense of this is to provoke a poleward deflection in the displacement. And in fact, when you actually look at the constant omega surfaces from the helioseismology data, the difference between their disposition is that they're not exactly radial. There is a slight poleward deflection quantitatively of about this amount. So the leading order equations invoke baroclinic structure. It's a physical picture, cartoon picture of what I have in mind. And if I were to sort of summarize the conclusions here. How am I doing the time mark? I should keep track of things. Uh, getting close. Getting close. We started a little late, so okay. Maybe. All right. Ten minutes. I'll finish up. Part one summary. Entropy in the convection is most efficiently mixed in surfaces in which convective cells are not sheared. Constant angular velocity sheets. Perhaps that's not surprising. But basically, the mathematical implementation of this, that this residual entropy is a function of omega squared, I think is a powerful analytic tool. The form of the isorotation contours in the sun can be determined, or at least can, can be worked out, their form, without a detailed knowledge of the convective turbulence, without a detail, without a knowledge, I should say, of the details themselves of the convective turbulence. The basic form is constrained by vorticity conservation. Now, what about the tachocline? I haven't said very much. Um, but let me just point out some textbook level issues. If I look at the entropy equation, where F now is the radiative heat flux, and I First, consider the case of uniform rotation, so that the pressure, the density, and the equipotentials 
all share the same distorted isosurfaces because omega is a constant and it can be shown directly that because omega can be incorporated as part of a gradient function, pressure, density, and phi, by definition phi, are constant on equipotential surfaces. Now, if I try to apply this equation directly for a time-steady, uniformly rotating sun, then it's well known that the divergence of f cannot vanish. And if you look in a, the textbooks, the explanation will be, well, well, the reason it can't vanish is, of course, that the equipotential surfaces are farther apart at the equator than the poles. You can't have the divergence of F vanishing under those conditions. The explanation, the way out of it, is meridional circulation. And if you look in the textbook, it's always done in terms of V dot gradient of the entropy, the energy flux. It's done in terms of the energy equation, because after all, this is the energy flux associated with the radiation. What I would point out is that we have a bigger problem here, because it's not the energy that we need to worry about, it's the entropy. Because if I go to the radiative convective boundary, if I come up from the radiative zone, and I start to enter the region where the gradient of omega is changing sign, and I don't have the V, I'm going to have the gradient of sigma is going to vanish on these surfaces. Well, if the gradient of sigma vanishes, then I'm in trouble because the divergence of F can't vanish and I have nothing to balance it on the left-hand side. Something has to give. Either the divergence of F must equal zero somehow, or a finite D sigma D theta has to appear along with a V theta over here. D sigma dr is going to be vanishing no matter what I do when I go th from the radiative to the convective zone. Either of these possibilities, the reconfiguring of the divergence of F or a finite D, D sigma D theta, chances are the divergence of F will change and I'll get a D sigma D theta. Any linear combination of those two things is going to break down uniform rotation. Indeed, it would break down any barotropic rotation profile at the outer layer of the radiative zone. So what I'm thinking is that the reason we're running into trouble in stars like the sun, and we don't have simple uniform rotation everywhere, I'm wondering whether the causative agent has something to do with what is going on at the tachocline when I make the transition between a radiative zone and a convective zone. The divergence of F, when you look through it, is precisely the right order that you need. The difference between that and, and zero. One, 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 let's see, do I have that slide? Yeah. Hang on one second. So. This is the location, as far as one can determine, where the radiative zone, convective zone boundary is. And you notice I have, to a rather good approximation, omega is pretty much kind of a function of r, spherical r, not quite, obviously, because of this uh, interesting divergence point here. But generally, the gradients, the radial gradients of omega are dominant, except in this small region around here, when I have differential rotation in the radiative zone. We can get a handle on this if I say that, say, the density is a constant on a surface which has this form, r times some function 1 plus a little epsilon, a function of r, times another function of cosine squared theta. That's from the symmetry of the problem. And I expand this out, and then I do the same thing with the pressure, and I plug that into the thermal wind equation, I get something that looks like this. That's an equation I can do something with. In particular, if I play with this a bit, 
if these f functions, these angular dependent functions, are different, but nearly constant within the narrow tackle line, that's a rather drastic assumption, but let's start with that. These are the background gradients in R. These all depend upon R. This is a cosine theta. And if I assume that the distortion is a P2 distortion, which would make these things constants, independent of angle, then the solution is omega is a function of R only, which in fact is kind of what it looks like to zeroth order. But in fact, we have to have at least not P2 distortions in the pressure and density, but up to P4. In fact, one can show that if omega squared has angular structure through order Pn, these are Legendre polynomials, I should have said before, density and pressure must in fact have structure through order Pn plus 2. And under those circumstances, if we do that expansion, including a P2 and P4 term, then a crude approximation gives us an equation that looks like this. So, bottom line, I don't have time to go through the details, but let me speed through this and summarize, is that we're able to do something with the convective zone. There are other approximations that can be made, but basically, the crude level of an approximation gives you a convective zone when I join it on to the analytic solution of the radiative zone that looks like this. A somewhat more sophisticated approximation, which I didn't have time to describe, actually joins more smoothly onto the analytic solution convective zone. And in fact, it is good enough that I ventured to overlay it on top of the helioseismology data. And the red is the entire, that's a purely analytic you write it down with pencil and paper. The red is an analytic function based on solutions to these differential equations. Black is the data. So I think that's a remarkable fit. Can I just ask, how do you achieve the addition of the shear layer? What are it looks like? Uh, uh, no, same, same type of trick, ex expanding. Yeah, don't pay attention to that because I haven't explained that at all. But it's the same, uh, it's the same type of process of expanding grad P and grad rho order by order. To summarize, this is what I would say is if I had known all this in advance and I could just have sat down in one afternoon and worked it out, this is what I would call the royal road to the solar convective zone rotation. One, thermal wind balance is the governing equation. Two, if that's the case, we need to understand how entropy and angular velocity are related. We need to focus on this residual entropy. And we can begin by assuming delta sigma is a function of omega squared in R. That's kind of the trick to get things going. Do Taylor series expansions. And we're rapidly led to the consideration of, purely on a mathematical basis, beginning by looking at residual entropy being a function of omega squared. Physics and dynamics also suggest there should be a link with the convective cells. Convective cells tend to be in surfaces of constant offset, residual entropy, as well as constant omega. This is supported by numerical simulations that resemble the sun. It is possible, then, to actually do something with the mathematics and work out a complete solution and it's also possible to use some of these techniques in a modified form to apply to the taco Klein, possibly the near surface shear layers, although I'm much less certain for that. And basically, a rather simple, simple dynamical theory. This is all old fashioned stuff. Integrals and pencil and paper can reproduce the helioseismology data rather well. Three sentence summary of my findings. Solar convective zone is in thermal wind balance. In the bulk of the SCZ, from near the surface down to about 0.77 R solar, residual entropy is a function of omega squares. Below that, within the tachocline, it's useful to think of the entropy as a function of omega squared and theta.
d omega squared dr proportional to this very simple angular dependence at the boundary. That d omega squared dr is not a Lagrangian derivative in this case, but a derivative along the characteristics that I've discussed. Final slide, wither. If this is something to this, we have a handle on some diagnostics of a convective medium. It's a way of understanding what the entropy gradient is, a very delicate quantity, or at least something about the entropy gradient, in particular, angular velocities of the entropy gradient through the gradient of omega. We have some functional forms, analytic functional forms, omega and r and theta for people who like to do dynamo theory. We have someone, we have something for people who like to do mean field turbulence theory. If you can tell me what the form, the functional relationship between delta sigma and omega squared is, that would be a nice result. And what about fully convective stars, something that Nigel Weiss and I started working on a few years back, or rotation in gas giant planets? Will they be very different if they don't have a radiative zone, convective zone uh, boundary? If what I'm working on uh, is on the right track, then they may in fact be very different looking, and that has yet to be fleshed out. So I've overstayed my welcome. Thank you very much. I'll stop there. because the velocities that are involved in the meridional circulation don't affect the dynamics at the level of the terms that I'm keeping. Do I think they are irrelevant to the problem? No, I think they are critical to understanding what's going on in the sun because I have this darn boundary condition that I need to impose before I can start my engine. I need to know what omega uh, is at, on some surface before I can tell you how it's going to evolve below that surface. And for that, it may very well be the case that the uh, meridional currents are setting that up in some way. That and perhaps something to do with these small Reynolds stresses are establishing the basic trend of uh, equatorially increasing omega profile. So that I wouldn't change my, the thermal wind balance theory to incorporate the meridional currents because I think they're not affecting the forces at this level, but they are affecting the critical boundary condition, which is determining, uh, in some sense, maybe even that's the big problem, why omega is small on the poles and uh, big at the equator. What you're going to say. It's basically the additional barrel clinic term, yeah. Indirectly, though, in the way that I have it set up. Now, I'm okay sort of down, you know, d sigma dr is exactly zero right at the boundary itself. Where I'm actually running into trouble is when I then penetrate too far into the radiative zone and d sigma dr picks up rapidly. That's when things start to break down. So I think I'm okay down 
to the green line, but not below. Yeah. Expand a little bit further on your statement that the convection is, convective cells are happiest when they move on surfaces of constant omega squared, or whatever it was that you were mm -hmm. saying. Yeah. No, I think what I would, basically in its, in its simplest form, what, I'm, what I would try to argue that the reason, the zeroth order description that everybody gave was that omega is a function of theta, omega is insensitive to R. What I'm saying is I think the physics of that is basically omega is a function of theta only and is constant along these R surfaces because convection is basically a radial process. What you're looking at to some extent in the bulk of the convective zone is the orientation of the convective cells. The convective cells smear out the offset, but for dynamical reasons as well, they also smear out omega. And the easiest way that I think I can see that that can happen is just by this process of mass conservation, where the, the unusual aspect of that is that the wave numbers that are involved are dominated by the shear. The wave numbers themselves are proportional to the gradient of omega. So k dot psi equals zero translates into rad omega dot psi. Does that give you some natural behavior with the tangent cylinder to the inside surface? It changes convective properties? It may. I haven't thought about it. Because but what are you getting at? In all of our simulations, the lower latitude things uh, have substantial alignment with the rotation Well, I think, in fact, there may be something that may be embedded in here. I haven't actually asked myself the question in those terms. But somehow, when the... If I can go back to the uh, a better slide. That near the... Near the poles, of course, once I, once I make the onsats that delta sigma is a function of omega squared that takes on a life of its own. And so near the poles, the sort of these horizontal dispositions seems to me are comfortable with the idea of having these kinds of convective cells that mix more or less, or have a large component that mixes horizontally as well. Whereas these sorts of cylindrical looking profiles also have switched over in a way that accommodates the change uh, in the disposition of the cells as you move toward the equator. So I think that maybe there may be something in the dynamics of the thermal wind equation and the assumption of varying you know, this entropy with omega squared that builds that in. But I, I, I don't know. I'm I'm just, I'm, I'm not giving, this is just an intuition. It's not a careful response to your question. Maybe we should stop there. I mean, if you have further questions, you can hang up and, and speak with Steve. So, but let's, let's thank Steve again. Thank you.